You're listening to Top Line Edmonton with Nick Lynham and JC Kennedy. Welcome back to the Top Line Edmonton Oilers podcast. We weren't quite ready to smash the concern alarm, but since we last talked after the big Heritage Classic where it looked like the Edmonton Oilers of old, not the best week for Edmonton. We're going to talk about it. Let's bring in our resident Oilers fan and analyst, JC Kennedy. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> Nick, this team reeks. Um, that is all I can say. They suck. It, it's been a it's tough embarrassing go. so far. It, it's been a tough go, especially with the expectations coming in. You can't even get joy out of Calgary being a mess because the Oilers so far are just as bad. Just as bad. So let's let's dive into the last two games. Which one yeah. came first here? The Oilers versus Nashville? Dallas. Dallas was the first one. Get yep. it backwards on my laptop here. The 4 3 game that didn't really feel that close. Oh, two God, big no. Sammy Gagne goals. Welcome back. There's a fun story. That's the only bright spot that's <laughs> making me smile right now is gone his soul back. The, the bright spot from Mr. Brightside himself. Sam Gunny comes back, scores two big ones in his return, but a 4-3 loss against the Dallas Stars. What was your takeaways? Yeah, another terrible start, another terrible game. I never felt like the Oilers were... We're really in it. They had a very strong pushback in the third. Obviously, we mentioned the Sam Gagne goals. But I was I was really looking forward to this game, as we saw coming out of the Winter Classic. They looked extremely strong. McDavid back looking extremely, extremely strong like he always does. But then we get into the Dallas Stars. Terrible start. Dallas scores pretty early into that game. And... They pretty much just didn't look back from there. I know we had the 1-1 tie, but that second period was just abysmal. It was embarrassing. And, yeah, like, besides, obviously, it was, I guess, Scotty's our fourth-line player. That's the only pushback we had was from him and his debut, Oilers debut, or back debut. Yeah, and what's, what's, what's interesting about this game is he put up 40-plus shots. Yeah. So, so you see that, and it's a positive. Uh, a lot of those looking at the the heat map came from the slot, which is a positive. But the the Oilers are giving up a ton from that same area as well. Yeah. Uh, I think you nailed it on the head. I thought there was a good pushback after that first goal and brought it to one one one. But during that tie game, that second period, like they got nothing. It was terrible. And you fall asleep at the wheel like that. Go into the third three one, early goal against. And you got to like the response, but at that point, it's a 4-1 hockey game. Score effects taken. Yeah. Team takes the uh, the foot off the pedal a little bit. You make it close late, but especially in the Oilers' position, and, you know, you get that late first period, you think that's going to push the momentum. To see them not even show up in the second period, it's got to be frustrating the way things are going right now. Yeah, no, absolutely, especially with the – the start, you figure in a one-one hockey game, you know it's it's time to take over in a game of like finally, and mm-hmm. it's just it's very disappointing to see how they performed in that second period, which inevitably cost them the game. And another aspect to this game, we were just talking about before getting on air, air where the five-on-five metrics are actually really strong for the Oilers, and we've seen that team in in years past where they were. A good 5-on-5 five five team, but not great. And that power play would bail them out. Yep. 0-4 o- for four in that Dallas game, in a game where they really could have used it, especially in the second period. But... Yeah, it's tough. No, no, it's definitely tough. Like, in the past, you'd see this is a game where the power play would go 2-for-4 four four or 3-for-4, four four, and you, you know you win this hockey game 5-4 or something bizarre like that. But, you know, the power play's still been very strong. But obviously hasn't been the lifesaver as it's been in the past couple of years now. So, And uh, four goals against and 27 shots. Uh, Goaltending remains a big, big issue. Continues to be a massive, massive issue. And it didn't get much better (laughs) moving into the Nashville game. 
Five two for the Nashville Predators, who <laughs> haven't been off the the hottest start, start themselves. They were four and six going into that game. One and four on the road going into that game. Yeah. Um, they've been kind of a chippy team this year. Like they've been involved in a lot of games. A big one out of Ryan O'Reilly with the hat trick, but. I mean, another game where Edmonton generates 35 shots, only score two, which in years past, you know, you're you're probably banking on more. Mm-hmm. And this was a game where the power play did come through with both goals. I mean, what was your takeaways from this one? Yeah, like a, a fairly strong start in the first 10 minutes. You know, the power play scores, like you mentioned, from the second unit even, not even the, the first one. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you know, what shoots them in the foot, they immediately give up a goal right away. And... You see, it just seemed like, you know, that's what really got them off the pedal was that goal. And this game was the most frustrating for me. I think it's just maybe the buildup where it came to a point where I think at the start of the third period, I almost just tried taking a nap before I had to go to my hockey game myself. Yeah, It was it was awful. And Soros wasn't even in the net where we've seen, you know, he steals games. Came from the backs of Kevin Lankinen. You know, there was a, there was some good opportunity, but... It's again, it's just not enough. You didn't get really any saves from Jack Campbell, and that was my definitely my tipping point here. I I don't even want to see that guy start another game for the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, before we're gonna get right into Jack Campbell, yeah. Stuart's gonna in a second here. Um, is it a sign of how the league's looking at the Edmonton Oilers right now when you're getting a backup goalie on a Saturday night? In between games against Seattle and Calgary, well, Dallas had Scott Wedgwood in net too, so <laughs> that's the a very a that's a message. very bad look. Like it's it's crazy because it is so early in the season. We're what eleven games in now, not yeah. even the Oilers having Oilers are at 10, ten games, ten games, yeah, yeah, eighth of the way into the season. <laughs> you know you're going up against Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl. And you're seeing backup goalies all week, and the, you're not winning. The Rangers started Jonathan Quick too, and got shut out. <laughs> Yeah, so, like, like this is a. I think like, this is a pre- pretty big problem. T- the league's not even respecting the no. Edmonton Oilers, and it's hard to say that you you can't blame them. No, not at all. Honestly, like it's it's that bad, and it's largely that bad on the back of a couple goaltenders. Right now, Stuart Skinner six <laughs> starts into the year, fifth worst by goal saved above expected. At minus five. Jack Campbell, five games started. Eighth worst at negative 3.8. Though it seems like he's in that for those big, big game goals again. So I can understand the, the frustration there. Pretty scathing comments in uh, Spectre's latest article mm-hmm. about him. Good guy, but not a good goalie. Can't stop pucks and you can't argue it. No. Um what do you even do here if you're the Edmonton Oilers with this goaltending? It is an absolute must where you have to look anywhere in the league and but just bite the bullet and get rid of that that contract if you can. Speak like Jack Campbell, mind you. You can the big thing that comes to mind is what LA did with Cal Peterson. They sent him down for a bit. Maybe that helps, but you got to look at what LA did and you just bite the bullet and move them and pay to do it. And yeah, you're obviously gonna have to pay up a premium to move, just move them. But I, I think you got to like that. This is bad. You got to bring in a new goalie. Stuart Skinner's not getting the job done either. I look at what LA paid. I think you're gonna have to pay just a bit more just cause I think he has the extra year of what Cal Peterson had, but it's going to be somewhat that in that idea range. And you, you have to look for a new goalie. Like, you're not winning anything with this tandem. Even if you squeak into the playoffs, you're winning maybe a round, if that, and that's just simply not good enough when you have these two star talented players on your roster. Who are coming up on big career decisions. Like yeah, that. exactly. That's not something we thought was going to be a serious conversation, but with the team looking like this, like everything's got to be on it's the table. It's taking the right turn now. for the worst. You got to do whatever it takes to turn this season around. And this is where it gets interesting, like coming in. Uh, Friedman kind of talked about it today on 32 Thoughts, actually, that if you're not going to get the goaltending, you're supposed to be in a win a cup year. You're going to have to bite the bullet and pay to get out of this contract, like LA did with Cal Peterson. Three and a half years at five million is going to be a big ask, and you got to kind of look around the league 
and find a spot. And that's where this gets interesting because I think that's the tough, tougher aspect of this right now. Where are you going to dump that goalie plus get one? Is it Arizona, who's now on a trajectory where they're probably not going to want to yeah, sit on They're going to want to start for, trending upwards now. Yeah, they're not going to want three and a half years of Campbell. Is it San Jose, but do you want really want Kakinen or Blackwood? Like, you're nope. kind of looking at the same you're, bet and paying to do it. Yeah, besides getting out of the contract, you're getting pretty much the same caliber goaltending. You, you're you going to have to get creative. Like I, Would the Blues do something around Bennington? <laughs> would you he's, want to make that? I was just gonna say, is he he's been okay, but do you even want that? It's an, probably another bad contract. You gotta Same try length, something. One million dollar more. Something that comes to mind, yeah, like maybe a three way with someone where you bring in a you know a goalie that you have interest in and trying to dump Campbell to a San Jose who's not going to be competitive for a very long time and yeah. that can use the assets. It's gonna be the worst team I've ever seen. It's looking that way. That's, that's wasn't my hot take on the Western show that they wouldn't win 20 games and I thought that was even like yeah. like generous. That might be like we they had the cool. line of like what was it like 60 points or whatever and we said even smash the under on that. Yeah. But that's even that's speaking of the Edmonton goaltending, San Jose gave up back to back 10 goal games and Edmonton's right there with them for goals like saved above expected, save percentage, everything. I look at dumping that, they had those small rumors with Philly with Hart, like would Philly want to, you know, take on another bad contract where they're not probably going to be competitive for a while? So they got to get creative. Like, they got to do something. I really don't care what it takes or what it costs. I, it's, I'm simply get it done mode. Like, you got to do whatever it takes right now. And, and I'm looking at teams right now. Philly's an interesting one. That does make some sense. You'd, they'd be paying Cal and... And that's the issue. Yeah. Like, does does Philly want to pay for two terrible contract goal? At 10 tending? million bucks. Yeah. So it helps uh, with the whole rebuild thing. Washington's an interesting one with Kemper. Yeah. Same length of term, uh, roughly the same amount. You're going to have to pay for the upgrade. And, I mean, he, he won a cup. League average guy. Probably a little underrated by many because he was so bad on that cup run. Mm-hmm. Um, that's maybe a spot. Is Jake Allen out of Montreal an answer? That's who I was thinking i just didn't know if what montreal's like cap situation was off the top of my head where i said third team i was thinking you know dump him to a san jose or whatever and then try and pay for the jake allen who's actually been a pretty underrated goalie the last couple years like he's Mm -hmm. he's stole a lot of games with that montreal canadians team and i don't see this as viable especially in season this would probably have to be an off season but one of the two Boston guys, did one of them shake loose at some point? I mean, yeah, like those, and both another solid tandem. I just don't know what you'd have to pay to have Boston's interest because they're looking like again in a win now mode where I don't think Edmonton has the assets to help them. Like, would they want draft picks or prospects? I, I don't think so. A couple other interesting ideas. Do you make the gamble <laughs> for Gibson swap? <laughs> Dude, uh, there's nothing that can be worse than Campbell. I would try, honestly, anything at this point. I don't even okay. care. I got two other ideas, and we'll move on from this topic. Yeah. This one doesn't seem likely because of the team it involves, and we're about to talk about them in defense. Do you make a bet on a, a Dustin Wolf? Or does Markstrom become available and they go to a Wolf later? I think Maybe, if They're it, not trading him to Edmonton, but... I th- yeah, I was going to say, I think if you're looking at... Calgary standpoint, they would want to see such a high caliber prospect get moved. Like if he does flourish, they'd look awful, especially to the yeah. biggest rival in Edmonton. I could, I don't know. Like I'm, I think if you're offering, like I we mentioned off air, if you're offering the best package, it shouldn't matter who you are. Like I think you can get a deal done. So if you're looking at a Markstrom or one of those three D men that have been listed as available, I like I said, if you're offering the best, I feel like you should be able to get that done. But, I mean, the NHL is weird at times where that doesn't always work. Yeah. So I, I got one more team. And it's going to take them falling out of it. Though, if you've listened to me this year, you know I'm a firm believer they're going to. The National Predators have two. Yeah. You see Saros and Askarov. Askarov's looking good in the A. Mm-hmm. At some point, that org's going to have to make a decision between those two, I think. Now, that team was gearing up for a rebuild. There was a lot of talk. Saros was the only guy that didn't move that they were shopping. Can you get them to take on a Campbell if you load them up on futures as they go through a bit of a retooling under Barry Trotz? See, that's where, like that was a very interesting one for me because if you're Nashville, you got to think you're not 
winning anything, you're maybe getting in as the second wild card and you're losing in four or five games. Mm -hmm. So where I thought that got interesting is because, again, you can move Soros for not going to be cheap whatsoever. You pay the premium to get Soros. You pay the, obviously, the extra to move the Campbell contract. And you start your full rebuild where you have Askarov up there. If you're struggling, whatever, you can throw Campbell in for a couple games. You're you're obviously tanking to begin with. So I think that is a very interesting fit. Mind you, Nashville's still obviously kind of in the race. Who knows what they're thinking at all? But I think that is a a very interesting spot where obviously Soros is game-changing if you get him. Oh, it changes changes everything. Absolutely. He's dealt with poor defensive play, poor game play almost his entire career, and he's been unbelievable. Yeah, and that that's a team that's had their eye on the future. I know there's still people high on them. I think they're I think Barry's coming in and looking longer term there. So that's a, that's an interesting one for me, honestly, as this season goes on. We had heard a lot of LA Saros talk in the summer. Mm-hmm. And what makes the Saros conversation, I think, the most interesting in season is we just saw this last summer how the NHL is valuing goaltenders one year away from unrestricted free agency. In the trade market with Connor Hellebuck. I mean, Saros was at five mil. Connor Hellebuck was only at six. Mm-hmm. We're talking about two of the top five guys. I wonder if Barry Trott saw what happened there and says, even if they're just outside, says, hey, we're going to get the most for him for, from a desperate team in season when we might get a late first in the summer. Yeah. So that, no, absolutely. Th- that's what I find interesting. Uh, let's move to the D, though, because another Friedman uh, kind of Scoop, I guess you could say, early rumors, is Calgary's starting to make calls on the three UFA D-men. Looks like Hannafin will no longer sign there. So they have Noah Hannafin, Chris Tanev, Nikita Zadarov, all pending UFAs, and the two teams mentioned by Friedman were Edmonton and Toronto. Merrick pushed back pretty hard and said, like, I don't think Calgary's bailing Edmonton out. Given the current climate, there is that dynamic. What do you think of potentially adding one of those 3D? Who would you prefer? What do you think could kind of go out? Because the Oilers are kind of in a cap-in, cap-out situation. Noah Hannafin's at 4.95 for reference. Chris Tanev at 4.5. Nikita Zadarov, 3.75. Yeah, given how the fit I see Edmonton's needs, I think Chris Tanev for me would be number one. I just think he is probably the perfect defenseman pair with Darnell Nurse. Like I mentioned off air, he's almost like, you know, your echo light type of deal. Mm-hmm. Um, the You know, just the ultimate shutdown defenseman. The Literally, the only question is, can his body hold up? You can't predict injuries anyway, yeah. so I'd be all in on that. Um, but, yeah, like we mentioned, like, would Calgary con- be considered, I guess, bailing out Edmonton? Who knows? Like I just mentioned, if you're offering the best package out of anyone in the yep. league, I feel like you should take it. But, yeah, I would do almost whatever it takes to get Chris Tanov. That changes your defensive core night and day. Like, it would make a world of a difference. So I'll throw a little trade scenario here. Cody CC mm-hmm. and a first-round pick for Chris Tanov. Who says no? That feels about right. Yeah, that feels right. That's kind of – I've been making mock cap-friendly trades. It's been kind of centered around CC. Obviously, the, the cap is close. The contracts are – I think – CC has the extra year. It's been either a first or prospect like a Broberg or a Xavier Borgo who X first round picks. So kind of the same idea anyway. So I, in my opinion, that feels right. Like the a lot of things I've seen is maybe fetching a second for now. So you're paying a little extra for the the rivalry or whatever. Yeah. I I don't see a problem and with that at all. Extra year on CC. Exactly. Even I don't think it's a bad contract. You're just you're paying Calgary to do the favor. Yeah, I I don't see an issue with it on either side, in my opinion. Yeah, I look at it this way. I think as much as social media and a lot of people want the Flames to blow it up, I don't think they're going to. No. They just have so much money invested to that group that I think they're going to prolong a rebuild, which means they're in a rebuild, but they're going to try and retool and. I think they could justify the idea of Cody CC's an NHL defenseman. He's going to fill in t- for Tanov in the minutes. They'll turn him into a pick next year's deadline. And they get a first, which first round picks are currency, right? So yep. I kind of like that kind of maneuver for both teams. We'll see if the, the Battle of Alberta comes into play. I imagine it will. Yep. But it's probably music to your ears to hear that the team is already 
taking shots at some defensive upgrades. Yeah, it's good to hear because they're going to need to get this done like sooner than later. Like this is this is bad. Because yeah, right now for me, they have a good pair in Ekholm Bouchard. Mm-hmm. Both guys have been a little more prone this year to make that big stupid mistake, but on the aggregate, it's been solid. They've been good. The CC nurse thing, we just know it doesn't work and it hasn't worked, especially for the minutes they're playing. I think yeah. Cody CC is really solid in a third pair. You're just asking him to, to do too much. And there's a lot of guys like that in the NHL. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No. But if you upgrade that spot and then you're running Kulak with one of the young guys, it seems like DRNA has the kind of foot up there. I think you're in better shape. You also clear out a little bit of money for next year when we know the Oilers are already kind of capped out. So you'd give yourself a little bit of flexibility by paying that extra cost. Yeah. I just think that kind of deal makes too much sense if Calgary was willing to do it. Because, yeah, the, despite the 2 7 one start, you have to be all in on this group this year. No, absolutely. Like, it's Drysaddle's contract year next year. Like, you got to at least be showing signs that you're willing to do literally whatever it takes to win the cup. Because yep. at the end of the day, that's really all that matters, right? And... Let's let's talk about how this team was put together. There's a lot of calls for Woodcroft's job right now. Where do you stand be, on that? That was going to be my next question. Like, do you think he should get fired? Me, personally, I think no. I had a conversation with one of my buddies who's also an Oilers fan previously on what our thoughts were. Like, the Oilers have had multiple coaching changes in the last couple of years. Like, I, I really don't think Woodcroft is the issue. Mm-hmm. He he came in and the changed the team around pretty much instantly. I feel like if anything it does have to give here, it's it's got to be Kenny Holland. 100%. Like I just personally don't think Woodcroft's the issue at all. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I can't bring myself to justify firing Woodcroft when goaltending is fucking him so hard. Mm-hmm. It's the one area that a coach has no control over. Um, it's You said coming into the year. I said coming into the year. The biggest risk was going with the same two guys that stumbled down the stretch last year. Obviously, you had more. we both had more hope in Stuart Skinner. I think that's who we still trust in this duo. But everyone could look at this team and know that was going to be the red flag. Yep. And at the end of the day, the, the Oilers' mess does fall on Ken Holland, a guy that I've been very vocal about in the past. In the last 12 years, the guy has not figured out how to manage an NHL salary cap. Like you said, in the, in McDavid's era, they've had, what, three or four coaching changes at this point, all sure. early in seasons. And at some point, no matter what he did 20 years ago in Detroit, you got to look at what's going on here. Because I think the, mostly the Oilers' window over the Connor McDavid era went to two of the worst general managers in the modern day at managing salary caps. Yeah. Never mind having two of the highest paid players to try and do with. The Oilers, time and time again, have brought in absolute morons to run this. Yeah. It has to be Ken Holland first. He put this together. No, absolutely. They are capped out this year and probably next year with this roster. Yeah, like Ken Holland absolutely fumbled the one year where he got out of all those bad contracts and just signed absolutely nothing to really help this roster significantly. Besides Hyman, I'll go down to war for that one. That's the best. That's that's literally it. it. But he bit the bullet for previous resume going bridge on nurse. But then he went and paid him like he was a top five defenseman in the NHL. That is clearly the biggest issue on this roster outside of Jack Campbell. Darnell Nurse was always a fine top four defenseman. Yeah. How did you get backed into a $9.25 million deal forever? Um, I will say this. Connor McDavid's hands are all over some of these moves too. He signed off on a lot of this. So... The idea that he might ask out because of the roster frustrates me a little bit because yeah. a lot of these were his buddy or he trusted this guy. Yeah, I will say, though, Evander Kane has turned it around pretty nicely because I know we've been hinting that that might be ending up as a bad signing. Mm-hmm. His last stretch, he's pro- maybe been the best player. He, he's responded so well to yeah. that uh, benching and media thing. Yeah, Got to give him credit because, like, like I talked about, I was worried about that going south given yeah, his history. Yeah, as was I. Um, but just the roster makeup alone, how do you have this many holes in a lineup with two of the best players in the world? Yeah, it's bad. Like we've said it time and time again, like it says a lot that we're trying to look for a deep partner for Darnell Nurse making that cap. 
if we said if he was making about three mil less, finding him a partner is it doesn't sound as bad. He obviously just didn't take that jump. Like it's just a lot of bad signings. Obviously, the Campbell one has been dreadful. It like it's times need to be changed. You got to bite the bullet and just get out of some of these deals. I really don't like. You can't care about what the future holds. Like you have Your the two now. best players right now. You got to do whatever it takes. Your future is now with those two. One hundred percent. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm out on the J. Woodcraft firing. I think you have to look above him and the guy above him, Bob yeah. Nicholson. Yeah, let, give, give this team over to Jeff Jackson and let start, start it new here, because. Yeah, like I'm scared. Like, what? Like Ken Holland makes a panic trade. I don't even want to know what that's gonna look like. And based on his panic trades in season, the two seconds for <laughs> what's his, what's his nuts? That's to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Like. That's two valuable assets, man. Yeah, for someone who did not work out as, at all. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Um, we saw the kid come up this week, though, Raphael Laval. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't bad. I, I, you know, you can see obviously glimpses of him looking like a good NHL player. It's just the Oilers had two stinkers in those games, like the the Nashville game. Like the team just looked so bad. Like I. I want to see more of Raph Lavoie. I've liked what I've seen when he's been up. I've liked what I've seen in the AHL. Um, yeah, it's it was definitely a good start. It was a promising start. Sam Gani's looked good. Like the depths has look is looked fine. Like it's mm-hmm. a big thing is the goaltending. I can't stress this enough. Yeah, and what I find interesting actually, let's let's take it here to end it. When talking about the Fords, the depth's been okay. Mm-hmm. Evander's had a great stretch. Hyman's been Hyman. Drysaddle's been Drysaddle. What's going on with Connor McDavid? I think he came back too soon. I think they were really pushing to have him for that classic game. You made a good point. Was possible adrenaline? You know, coming back. The you know, obviously the big game that's been hyped. Battle the Battle of Alberta. Alberta. Outdoors. Yeah, like he looked great. I thought you know he was actually fully healthy. But yeah. these last two games, like. He's obviously looked fine because he's McDavid, but definitely not nearly, you know, the... The, the guy we're used the, to seeing. Exactly, so... Like, and yeah, like, he's on such a pedestal. Being, he treats the NHL like a beer league most nights. So it's evident when he's just just another guy out there that's got some high-end offense, but mm-hmm. looks like he's struggling a bit. And I do wonder if they rushed him back because if, at first it was probably a couple weeks, oh, we'll reevaluate him. Day before the... The game, it's like, oh, he's probable yeah. for the game. Like, they said a week to two weeks. I truly think it was obviously a lot closer to the two weeks. They just threw in the week just because that game was coming up. Yes. And you, the scary thing is, obviously, you really can't sit him anymore just because you're in such a jam right now. So it is, it's not looking good, man. Yeah, it's uh, tough times in oil country. I'm officially hitting the panic button just because of how far back it is. Like, we know the, the stat Freed loves to say if you're – Outside four points by November third, fifteen percent chance of making the playoffs. The Oilers have the two guys I bet on on making up that type of gap. But you look at the standings, and in the Pacific, you've had some good starts. Obviously, Vegas eleven one and one. They've won the division. I'm saying this right now. <laughs> they look incredible. What did just the Colorado? It's in seven nothing. Seven. That nothing. was the game I said I was looking forward to watching. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Canucks red hot at eight two and one. Yeah, I do think they'll come down to earth at some point. But again, they still have some soft games ahead here, and they're making hay. But I mean, if they win tonight, can you like? It's a very hard vision to see Edmonton catching them as well. Right, right now the Oilers are at five points. Mm-hmm. Currently fourth in division is the Ducks at fourteen point seven four. Another hot start, but a team I don't think we expect to be there. No, by the deadline. Kraken haven't had the greatest start, but they're still banking some overtime losses, four, six, and two. I think they'll find a stride. I know I don't know if they'll make it in this year as much as I thought they were coming in, but I think they'll be kind of competitive down the stretch. Mm-hmm. So that's a nine point gap just on them. LA, seven, two, and two. That Ford group looks fantastic. Yeah, I can't see Edmonton catching them either. Like and, and the Kings are already talking about, like, they're going to be patient with the goaltending because they're off to such Talbot's a Talbot's actually been very solid so far. Yeah, so, so it's like, <laughs> it's it's early, but it's not when you're 2-7-1. No. And you're going to have to jump at least 
three, four teams, unless you're just talking about the last wild card spot. Exactly. It's a tough hill to climb in this league. Again, it's not a team I want to bet against doing it. And there's going to be pathways to the wild card with how bad the central is, but we're in panic territory. Early. Oh, absolutely. Like I see the path to the wild card, but like I've mentioned, like if you lose tonight to Vancouver, that gap is massive. And I don't care that you have 70 games left. That is a lot of points you got to make up. In LA's stretch, I can't see them catching them. Like, you're banking on making the wild card at that point where you're playing a Vegas, Colorado, Dallas. Like, you have a hell of a first round right from the get go. If they lose to Vancouver tonight, do we see a mercy firing? Like, there's going to be some kind of panic button there's, here internally somewhere. <laughs> there's got to be something. You go, whatever the overtime loss, regulation loss, still only two wins. There's going to be a panic. Something, whatever that looks like. Like, this is a massive in division game, really. Yeah. That cat just gets wider. And. Do you think it's tonight, or do you think if they somehow choke to the San Jose Sharks? That's okay. So, that's what's fascinating because this is the type of week early on you look at the schedule, and you're like, okay, hey, this is where you have to make some hay. If they lose tonight, that Sharks game becomes must-watch hockey for all the wrong reasons. But even if they win the night and lose to the Sharks, really, what changed? Right? I feel like you got to go on a little bit of a win streak here, no? If, if they lose, no matter what, to the Sharks on Thursday, something's got to happen. Yeah, like, just to, like, if they're the Sharks' first win, <laughs> like, how is that going to feel? It, like, this is actually possible right now. Yeah. No, it is. Like, that is... That's not a layup game with the way the Edmonton Oilers have been playing. And it's insane we're even talking about that. It is. The Sharks just let in 10 goals in back-to-back -back games. Yeah. I, this is a, f a fascinating week for the Edmonton Oilers. Let's throw some projections out there. They got three games before we'll probably talk next tonight against the Vancouver Canucks. What's this one look like? Uh, loss. I it's hard There's to two bet. teams in the in opposite direction right now. I just, I want to say Edmonton's going to come out firing, but I want to say that against Dallas and Nashville, and I just simply haven't seen it. I I can't see them winning this game, honestly. I, Demko's I, been the best goalie in the league so far. I haven't looked, but I imagine he's starting. Though like, Edmonton's been playing nothing but backups, so well, let's who see knows? What's on the old projected here. Even though DeSmith was unbelievable when they played. so He's actually been really good there. Yeah, they've like, had really very good. solid goaltending. I, I can't see them beating Vancouver tonight. So, Demko's confirmed. Demko. Okay. And, and it's obviously Skinner because. Yeah. So, this is interesting <laughs> because at 5-on-5, five five, Edmonton's been very good. Mm -hmm. Vancouver has not. If you look at their numbers. Yeah. Um, but on the other side of things, Vancouver's elite guys are red hot. Best players in the league right now. Oh. Quinn Hughes is shutting everybody up on the Norris side of things right now. And he's put up, what, 16 points now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, PD. Today's a statement night for Elias P Patterson, I think, in the Pacific yeah. hierarchy. JT Miller has been off to a hard start. He's answered his benching pretty well. Demko's been great. Phil peronic has been a very good yeah. ad for them. I'm I'm taking the Canucks today too, man. Yeah, like I know what we saw in Rexall in game two, but I just I just can't see I just can't see it right now. It's two teams at polar opposite ends exactly. of the spectrum. Which brings us to the to the loser bowl. <laughs> the Oilers is. in San Jose Thursday night. It's embarrassing to think that both teams are looking forward to playing each other, thinking yeah. that they can try and turn something around. I gotta take. I gotta take the Oilers. I, I honestly, I'm saying this right now. I really won't be surprised if they lose the game. I just, I cannot. A team that's just been scored on back to back ten goal games. I cannot see it. I will be in shambles if they lose to the San Jose Sharks. If if there was ever ever a night for an <laughs> offensive explosion, I'm gonna go seven one Edmonton Oilers on Thursday. Dude, night. I'm. To say I like I'm nervous as hell for that game. I'm I I'm not. You. I don't blame you. I, I am feel not sick sitting back. About it. Like I will not be surprised if it's a six-five goal game. I might have to stay up until like twelve thirty to watch this <laughs> shit, just to see, just to see what the hell happens. Yeah. And I want them to make me turn it off after one period with like a four-nothing. I'm praying, <laughs> but yeah, I will not be surprised if it's you know a 
nail biter right to the end. And then Saturday, another another big one, just because of the standings we're talking about. They play each other two of the next three. Seattle Kraken. <laughs> so they like need we, both those Kraken games, I think. Yeah, they do. Like we've said, this is a obviously a massive, massive week. If they do look good against Vancouver and you know come out hot against San Jose, I think they'll beat Seattle. But if you know what? I think no matter what, they'll beat Seattle because I think if they obviously lose tonight and lose to the San Jose Sharks, there's going to be some changes and you just have to have to come out firing after some significant change. So I think no matter what, they're beating Seattle. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to go one and two. Or sorry, two and one. Sorry, I'm two and one. <laughs> I'm going to take them to win back-to-back games in San Jose and Kraken. But then I think they're going to have a snoozer disappointment that following Monday in Long Island. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. That's a team who is, lives for snoozers as well. So And they're getting the offense out of Bo Horvath. Yeah, too. they have. So, hey, we'll see where this is at the end of the week. I don't know if I'm looking forward to or dreading potentially talking was, to you next. I was just going to say. <laughs> but uh, I'm at... I'm absolutely fascinated by where this franchise is. I'm right just now. curious to see what's going to happen, honestly. Yeah, I'm right there with you. There, there has to be some kind of mercy firing this week. Yeah, there's got to be. If they lose tonight, if they lose tonight, that's almost what I got to be. And I, yeah. I don't think it should be Todd Woodcroft. Jay Woodcroft. No, or, uh, yes, def- sorry. <laughs> that's whatever. No, I, uh, I'll be extremely disappointed if that's the move that gets, gets made. Fascinating. Fat. Like, Okay, we'll end it off with this. If they were to go that route, who are you bringing in to try and bump this team right now? I like Bruce. That's why I said bump. You need the Bruce <laughs> bump. You need some good vibes. You need I, an offensive need coach. Yeah. I will say this. Uh, Ricketts did make an interesting point in our Toronto podcast this week, talking about how Woodcroft tried to shift the defensive system like Vegas. And my response to him was kind of, I get why, because it just beats you. Yep. But Edmonton doesn't have the personnel to play that style of game. No, they just they don't have the decor. They don't have the decor. Or the defensive players of Vegas. And only like three or four teams could afford to do a box plus one in hockey these days. No, exactly. It's like the Rangers, Vegas, maybe Colorado, mm-hmm. and probably the Islanders. But yeah. just... The There's th- not a lot of teams. And Vegas is obviously... Ha- so, for having those caliber of D-men and those big and strong of D-men, like, it just simply d- does not work for the Oilers. Yeah. It, it, so th- that's like the one aspect I could kind of put on Woodcroft yep. is not understanding the personnel. And I think that's a big thing for hockey teams. Because, yeah, Vegas, it, it's pretty pretty interesting how good Vegas has been despite being outplayed 5-on-5. Five five. Yeah. But, it, like, my big takeaway this week watching them against Winnipeg was, sure, they let up some decent chances but they just swarm you in transition so fast yeah and they score off the rush off odd man's left like i don't know if it'll lead to a deep run again but it's also a team i have trouble betting against because of that personnel to be able to pull that no off. absolutely especially if they're getting the goaltender you know? yeah they both of them have just been insane yeah so yeah let's see where this goes good luck this week Dude, JC. for better or for worse honestly at this point i'm just Curious to see what's going to happen. It yeah. is fascinating. It, it, it really is. Uh, right now, I'm fascinated by Edmonton, Toronto, and uh, Ottawa for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's see where this week goes. Let's see if you're if I need uh, if I need to bring you a <laughs> tissue box next oh, week, man. a punching bag maybe. Both. <laughs> that San Jose game, man. Oh, I'm nervous already. I'm nervous for you. Yeah. And uh, we'll be back to talk about it all next week. So thanks for tuning in. Make sure to like, subscribe, send it around, comment in the in the comment section. You know, we like getting that involved. We're going to try and incorporate that a bit more. And uh, we'll be back to talk next week. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> this has been a Top Line Media production.